Across the Park podcast is proud to be sponsored by Globe Gas and Heating. For the best kitchen and bathroom renovations, boiler servicing and repair, and central and underfloor heating in the Northwest, head over to globecentralheating.com and quote Across the Park for a free quote. That song is an earworm. I guarantee you'll be whistling it despite being a Palace fan. Welcome to Across the Park podcast, the big match preview, the opposition preview as Crystal Palace play host to the Mighty Blues this Saturday down in the nation's capital. And me and Mills, you know that already. Returning to the show, Crystal Palace fan, friends of ours, D from Back of the Nest. D, how are you, my friend? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me on again. Um, it's good. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, I want to get into, we, we sort of left off last season. One of the questions I asked you was about Roy Hodgson. And you, you were very much on the fence. You were very much like, if it's the right thing for Palace, then we'll do it. I'm, I'm on about, you know, Roy Hodgson being the manager for this season. Mm. Roy got the gig. Um, I, I don't know how many managers you, you were rumoured with or, or to, to, to go for, if you will, but... Can you talk about that process? How did it go down with the Palace fans and you personally? Is is that thing turning out to be the right choice so far? With the manager talk, it was never about just Roy itself. It was about the ambition, the long-term ambition of the football club. Mm. And this summer, there were some interesting names out there. There was, you know, of course, um, Graham Potter, who done yeah. well with Brighton before he went to Chelsea. Didn't work out. There's managers abroad as well. So there were a good selection of managers that Palace could have went for. But you never really got that feeling that we wanted another manager. We spoke with a few of them, but mm. it seemed like let's have a talk. And and that was it. It was it was nothing really serious. It, I think the plan was all along to bring back Roy Hodgson, which I do understand because the last 10 games under Hodgson, not only did he keep us up, but we actually played some attacking football has been so defensively which we've never seen under Roy previously yeah and it, it, Roy so far has done a very good job I would say um with the with the injuries that we've had and the fixtures um I've been very surprised by it we haven't played the same attacking football that we played in the last 10 games um with Hodgson but you know he's here for another year um the fans want the best for him um, because end of the day, he didn't have to come to Palace end of last season. He could have easily just, you know, um, you know, stayed at home as a retired man, <laughs> not having yeah. to stress for Premier League football. But he came to the football club for the love of the football club, and and I have respect <laughs> for that. But now we will be end, we'll end up in the same position next summer. We'll have to find another manager because Roy is only here for a year, and I doubt that he'll sign a contract extension because. You know, 76 years old, I, I don't know how long he would want the same management for. So, so yeah, look, it's been good so far, but I don't think the club really wanted another manager apart from Roy. A, a, bit, a bit of a deeper question in, into what you've just said there. Um, and, and again, I know you don't speak for every Palace fan, so you can come mm -hmm. at it from your personal opinion. You've, all, you've basically said there that he's here for one more year. Now, for me, from the outside looking in, that's not somewhere to build, to put the foundations into a plan. So are you sort of writing this season off, let's be safe, and then you plan from the summer? Not really, um, because I think we've still got quality players, players that we've been linked with, that have been linked with top clubs for, you know, mm. serious money, like Eze, De Lise, uh, Gehi, Anderson, Decore. He's, there's all these players were linked uh, yes. with big moves over the summer. So if you've got that, all that quality in your side, I think we want to see something this season. And the the age objective is top ten. Roy said it. Uh, see, Parrish has said it as well um, when Roy um, signed a new extension at the club. And I think that is achievable with these group of players. The only problem that we have is that we don't have the squad depth. We could have improved it in the summer, but we didn't um, act seriously, and we left it till deadline day to bring him forwards, and it just didn't work out. So for me, staying up will not be enough. Um, and a lot of Palace fans as well. I've, of course, there'll be some that will be happy staying up regardless because, you know, some people will be. Um, but the objective this season is to try and get the best out of these players and hopefully create something for the next manager to come come into Palace and then just try to build on it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting. I've got expectation this season, especially by bringing Hodgson back. Uh, one man I do want to talk about who's not there. And for me, from the outside, 
it seemed like it was every year. So for you, possibly it was worse. It seemed like Wilfred Zaha was yeah. always going to leave Crystal Palace for the, for the last number of years. I think even we were linked to them at one point. He did leave in the summer. I know you guys made a really strong contract offer to keep him, and he was touted around all these different clubs. How how does it feel? Life without Zaha, how, how does it feel? Honestly, it feels good or okay. Like, we... Of, of course, you would have loved to have him in certain games because right now we're starting to jeopardize up at left wing. And that's mainly due to the injury problems that we have. And we've had a ton. We've had an awful injury uh, crisis to the start of the season where every, literally every day there'll be another player out injured. It, it reached a point where Roy had to write down the players' names on the paper just to see who's in the training session. It was about like 12, 13 players out injured at one time. Um, and I think that hurt us more than Zaha leaving. But we didn't have Zaha for the last 10 games last season and we were playing some great football. I think we found themselves with Eze and Elise, solid attacking replacements that, of course, you would love to have Zaha in your team. But if you don't have him, we could survive. And I think we have shown that so far. No one's really mentioned Zaha as Palace fans. I feel like we've all moved on. It was going to happen one day. He's not going mm -hmm. to be staying at Palace forever. That's not possible. He's, you know, went to Turkey to play Champions League football. That's his main priority there. Um, and we're trying to build on the football club. So I think for both parties, it's, it's worked out fine so far. But if you ask me, would I have liked us to keep Zaha? 100%. Uh, because I think he's still a quality player. But then again, we're fine without him. It's not, it's not as bad as people expect it, to be fair. Yeah, again, it's always different from the outside, which is why I love doing these shows, because most Evertonians, I'd imagine a little bit like me, oh God, Zaha's gone to Palace, they're going to be screwed, mm. and it's, it's not always the case. I'm looking at your summer spending, D, and it doesn't seem like you really spent a lot. I think it was just under £40 million. Um, Dean Henderson, really good goalkeeper. Rob Holding, I think, is clever. I think Jefferson Lehman on a free transfer is a really, really good sign. And uh, the one name that sticks out to me there is Matthias Franke. Now, I don't think I've seen much of him this season. Is that one for the future, or has there been injuries or form? Um, so he's been out injured. He's just come okay. back from an injury. Um, he came off the bench against Newcastle and also the last game against Tottenham as well. Um, and he didn't feature in a burning game. But yeah, he's just coming back from injury, 19 years old, Brazilian attacker mm. um i don't think he's you can say the winger you can say he's a number 10 but it's not clear yet it's more about potential one for the future but then again there there are expectations as well because i mean we spent 20 million pounds on a 19 year old um yeah. with add-ons it could go up to i think 25 to 30 million pound and mm. it's, it's funny but there's an add-on there for like a ballon d'or clause as well that that, that they've added if he was to be nominated that's how highly they regard him and he was linked with newcastle he was linked with chelsea as well but Palace managed to get the job done was working hard for him all summer long um but funny enough speaking about him he played for the under 21s um i think it was only yesterday night for against okay. afc wimbledon and I think he didn't have the greatest of games and there's people already writing him off. I'm thinking he's 19 years old. He just come from Brazil. He's had injuries. He hasn't had, you know, he's still settling in a new country, new environment, new language. Yeah. And after three games, people want to write him off. So he's one for the future. He's actually an exciting player. When he has come off the bench, I've been very impressed with him. He has a confidence um, of an experienced player. He doesn't lack it 100%. And I think we most likely won't see him in Everton game. Uh, he'll might be on the bench, should be on the bench. Uh, but yeah, he, he has got that flair about him. Oh, and one thing before we move into the actual game it, itself, and it, it, again, when I looked at your, your income and transfers, one thing for me as an outsider is, is I said, where was the, where was the striker? I, I mm -hmm. thought Palace would have went and got, maybe not even a striker, but a forward player. Now, you're saying Franca, as the season goes on, could develop into it. But is there enough in, in is there enough up front for Palace to have a really good season? Because I know you've got Jordan Ayew, you've got Edward, Will Hughes. Is that enough to really push and have a, have a really good season? Or do you probably need more when, when the window opens again? Uh, yeah, we 100% we need more. I think we're relying on more. I think Lerma was a fantastic in midfield anyway, next to Decore. That's also yeah. our midfield. We've got midfield of Lerma, Decore, Eze when everyone's fit. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Um He's got creativity defence there as number eight. We've got, we got everything. We've got a combination of everything. But we needed a striker. We needed a forward. And this is where this whole debate for the whole summer, even till now, is going on, saying, why on earth did we spend £20 million on Dean Henderson when we know his injury problems and whilst we have Sam Johnston in goal, who's got five clean sheets this season, um, 
and that's the most any goalkeeper has had, and and that's in eleven games. Like, why? Why do we spend that money if we don't have the budget? If we have a budget of forty million pound, why spend nearly half of it or half of it? I think it's about fifteen to twenty mm. on on a backup goalkeeper. It just didn't make any sense. Now he's he's a good, very good option to have a backup goalkeeper, but it's it's about picking your priorities. We we needed another forward. We needed depth yeah. options there. Injuries have hurt us, but another striker. We've seen with Edward. Edwards actually had a solid start to the season, much better than last season in terms of his overall game. But we know what to expect from Mateta, Edward as well. Now was the time to go bring in another forward and try to push on alongside Eze and Elise. Eze and Elise are still there, but another forward would have come a long way. France, I guess, could be that forward, but he's still young. It's more about potential. And yeah, it was if summer window was very frustrating. We left it to a last minute deadline day. It was linked with Hugo Ekitike uh, from PSG, which I mean, a few days before the window shuts, we had like three or two, three uh, months to sort the problem out. So it was a frustrating window, in honesty. We, we, I mean, Loma was probably our best signing. Um, but yeah, the, the Dean Henderson one was the most baffling thing because it, it meant that we didn't bring in another forward. Yeah, it, it sounds a little bit like ourselves. We, we sort of left it late. We've got Dominic Carvalho, who, who, as everybody knows, is, is a good striker, but it's some, he's someone that we just can't get on the pitch consistently. We went and signed Beto from, from Serie A. He hasn't really hit the ground running. Um, he's very, very raw, very big, and will cause problems. But he's he's adapting. And the younger signing we got was was Youssef Chimiti, who who has played a handful of first team games for Sport Lisbon, and on the eye isn't ready. So it sounds a little bit like us. We were in the market for the striker, and probably in hindsight, we probably should have done a little bit more than, than what we did. But our hands are tied. You know, us with the FFP problems and. Everything that comes with it, we're having a bit of a tough time. Just to get your opinion on on, on the Blues day from the outside, um, how do you see the situation at Everton? Because I'm not too sure whether you're aware too much, but the 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 breach of the FFP rules that hearing has been. We're waiting on an outcome. There could be points deductions. There could be transfer bans. We we internally seem to be in a little bit of chaos, and it, it feels to me. Being an Evertonian is like being in deep water and you just can't get to the shore. The more you mm. swim to the shore, the deeper it gets. Do you see from the outside Everton in trouble or have you got a bit of a, a, another perception? Um, I don't think Everton's in trouble. If we're talking about, I don't know, that's the thing with Everton, you just don't know. If, if There's so much always going on with Everton. It's like any any other day, it, it could be something else. That's points deduction. Mm. Of course, it was sad about um, Bill Ken Wright. That's, of yeah. course, that's going to disrupt a lot of things as well at Everton, but I mean, when you look at when you look at what's been going on at Everton, there's been a clear problem with the structure, ownership structure of the club. Um, I know there's a new ownership group that could potentially be coming in. Now, I've heard a few things about that group, and you know more, more you know more than me about I've it. I've heard the same. I've heard the there's same. A, there's a few question marks even with that group as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and 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 how and how they like to proceed things, but for Everton. It, I'll be honest, it sounds so boring, so so lame, but until you sort out your other problems, and that's behind the scene problems with the stadium, with the finances, um, with the ownership, you you just need to stay up in the Premier League. Mm. You just need to stay up in the Premier League because it's going to be hard to push on. <laughs> Maybe you can this season, but I'm just trying to think, top seven, top ten, you need to have everything else in place for you to push on to that. Right now, Everton, you don't even know if you're going to have a points deduction or a transfer ban. And that's why, as as boring as it may sound, which I, as a fan I'll be bored of it as well. The the the, the min the well, the minimum you have to you have to do. I think a good season will be mid table more than anything, but just stay out of the relegation fight and sort out your problems behind the scenes because I don't know how you can progress with all that chaos going on behind you. There's so there's so many things. If it was only one thing, I would understand. With the finances involved, that's another tricky element. The ownership um, now with this investigation. Yeah, I think Everton on the pitch have actually been solid this season in yeah. terms of, you know, picking up points and performances. I remember early on in the season, it was a case of finishing your chances, um, which, of course, um, you struggled with. But now slowly you're getting into rhythm, you're getting them results. So I don't think you've been terrible this season. In terms of picking up points, of course, maybe the side of football, Everton fans might want to see a bit more. But right now, you need stability. And I mean, who else is going to deliver that than Sean Dyche, who's, 
who done that at Burnley with limited resources. So I think for the short for the short to medium um, term, you just need to be patient. I think patience is the key with Everton. And then afterwards, once all these problems are solved, then you can look ahead and then you can look at the style and maybe some of the players and try to push on. But right now, it's so hard. Yeah, look, I think you've nailed it. I think for me, I'm, I'm sitting here nodding and agreeing. It's what I it's what I want. I want in April, I want to be able to sleep and not think about my football club because the past couple of years, you know, the game we, we, we you you were your team was part of it two seasons ago to sec, second to last game of the season where we stayed up and then last season born with the final game stayed up. I'm not too sure whether you've been there in your lifetime, but I, I tell you what, dear, I don't want no one to go through it unless you're a Liverpool fan because it's sleepless, sleepless nights, my friend, yeah, and I don't want that. So for me to have mid-table this season would be great. We've we found ourselves in the quarter-final of the League Cup. So all, 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 it's not looking too bad. I think the style of football does great on some fans, but I think when you remove yourself from that initial frustration of surrendering the ball and, and it's not pretty, if you remove yourself from that, the, the plan for Sean Dyche is to keep Everton in the Premier League. That's his job remit. He's got a two and a half year contract or a three and a half year contract. And the job remit in those two or three years is don't go down. And I think there's a style of football that comes with that. And I think patience, I think that's the, the best words, uh, how I can describe where we have to be as a fan base. Everything has to start again from the, from the grounds up for us, including the grounds, ironically. Everything's got to start again. And it almost has to be a little bit like a rebirth. And you guys yeah. went through that, didn't you, yourself, a few years back? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we done it under we done it under Hodgson. So when Hodgson left, actually after Hodgson, uh, when he last left and Patrick Vieira came in, we got rid of like ten players mm. or eleven players. Players out of contract. We brought in Elise, Eze, Gahey, Anderson, uh, Decore. It was like a new era. But then again, I think with Paris, it's a bit different because when we when we did do that, you know, restructure of of the players and the squad and the management we had pretty much everything behind the scenes sorted. We didn't have the financial problems. We didn't... Well, of course, we're trying to build a new stand, uh, not mm. a new stadium, uh, which has been ongoing for the past probably like seven to eight years. I know. What stand is that that you're trying to rebuild? Which one is it? Yeah, it's the it's the one uh, in the main stand. So we're trying to increase the capacity to like 32,000. So I think by six oh, right. to 8,000. Um, so, so yeah, that's... It's progressing. Um, construction is meant to start next summer now. So we've had, you know, we've had stuff going on behind the scenes as well, but it hasn't been as chaotic as Everton. <laughs> and I think that's the biggest difference. You want to build a new squad, but before you build a new squad, who, what type of football or what type of players do you want? You can't just bring in players just for your manager. You need to have an identity as a football club because managers will come and go. So if Everton Football Club want to play defensive football, then you should be targeting defensive, you know, defensive minded players. Or if you want to play possession football, you target them and then you bring in a manager that can get the best out of these players. Otherwise, you're going to always change about. And I think that's been the main problem with Everton. They've spent so much money on players. There's no indication of not spending money. In the past, you've spent so much on players. But the problem is you've spent money on players based on the manager's needs and rather than what the football club wants to do. Of course, a manager can request a player. But it's always, oh, you bring in Dash and you got players now that don't play that style of football. And then you bring in another manager and now you've got managers that play Dash style of football. That's why you need to make sure you support the sporting element as well. Have a sporting director, know what you want as a football club, and then build from there until you do that. Because with Palace right now, I mean, we got rid of Patrick Vieira, but even the players that we're targeting, we're targeting players based on what we want, not based on what the manager wants. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a key element as well for Everton and the biggest mistake that you've done spending all that money on some of these players. Some very good players there, but it's, it's, it's a bit confusing when you go down the list because there's a variety of players for different styles of football. Yeah, and, and I think one of the big problems was was Frank Lampard trying to rip it up. The, the moment that we, that we stayed up against you guys two years ago, he started talking about ex expansive play and bringing attacking players in. We were nowhere near ready for it, and that cost him his job. So, but the style of football we've got now, like I said, not easy on the eye for an Evertonian, but I think it'll be difficult for you to play against on Saturday. So we'll we'll get into that. Um, I looked at your form, D. Four wins, four losses, sitting mid table. You've spoke about you want to be top half as a fan base. I think what I think there's always a risk with injuries that that you could then possibly fall into it. Where I'm getting at is where you are now. Do you think that's sort of where you are as, as a football club, a mid-table Premier League team? 
Uh, yeah, um, I do. Uh, but the thing is with Palace, I, I don't think we've seen the best at Palace so far this season, which is why I've been very impressed. Apart from the Newcastle game, I would exclude Tottenham. Tottenham had you know, a bit of frustrations there. We haven't been that bad this season. Even when we beat Burnley 2 you know, I was not happy with it because we have got, you know, a bit of a bit of standards in terms of how we want to win games as well. And we beat Burnley 2 you know, in, in the last game at, at Turf Moor. But it wasn't a great game of football for Palace. Um, I know we could have done better. We should have done better. And we managed to get a result done. But look, we're three points off 15th, I think, and three points off 7th. And we've yeah. got these run of fixtures. And we picked up... You know, we're, we're in this position whilst not having Eze for a good few games, not having Elisa play a single minute. The Corey was out injured. Um, we've had Dean Henderson, our backup goalkeeper, out injured. Eduardo Schreifer out injured. Uh, Schlupp was out injured. All these players have been out injured. We, we're slowly getting these players back. So we managed to pick up results whilst yeah. having nearly our starting 11 uh, at a certain point of the season, our starting 11 out completely needy. Um, so it's been very impressive. And now when these players are slowly coming back, and if we if we have Elise back as well, as well as Eze, who came off the bench against Burnley, you got an assist, I think you'll see more out of Palace. So it's a case of, you know, taking a game at a time. Um, I'm not looking too far ahead. Um, it's about looking at individual games, thinking, you know, how many points should we pick up there if we want to have a good season. And the Everton game is not going to be easy by any means. But if we want to become, you know, serious this season about pushing on, then at home, we should be trying to get that win um, as good as you've been recently. And the same with Everton. You should be looking at Palace thinking, well, if we want to push up the table and catch up to the likes of Palace and the Brentfords, then this is a good opportunity. Let's beat Palace. You know, I think both clubs can look at this game with the mindset of, we should be trying to win. It, well, it depends on how you view it, but that's how I'm viewing it. I think Palace should be trying to beat Everton. And I mean that with respect because you lot have been playing very good if we want to push on. Now, I'm not saying, I don't know if we will or not, but yeah, it's been it's been um, impressive. I, I I know we're sitting eleventh right now, but that could easily change on a week, and we could drop down lower or go much higher as mm. well. So, game at a time. That's my mentality. Game at a time. Uh, so this game, I'm going to give you the secret today. What we're going to do is we're going to give you the ball, and you've got to break us down. Does that make it a difficult afternoon for Palace? Uh, yes, it does. But the biggest, um, I think. Um, factor for me that's giving me a bit more confidence is the fact that Eze now should be starting and Eze could be that difference maker we've seen him for mm -hmm. England as well he's been against like, for England um being playing at Palace going assist as I said when he came on against Burnley um I'm expecting him to be the difference maker I think it, it'll still be difficult I'm not really expecting that many goals in this game in all honesty um we have been solid defensively so it'll be um I, I wonder how Everton will try to break us down as well on the counter because Yes, we'll try, you know, break you down, put you know numbers forward, but I don't think we'll go all out attack and leave our defensive structure. I think at, even at home, we'll make sure that we're still solid defensively, but we'll, you know, we'll put one or two plays forward uh, to hurt you. So I, I think it will be a difficult game for both sides. I think Everton solid defensively, Palace also um, should be um, good in that aspect. I mean, we're joint top in terms of clean sheets so far this season. Um, and that's that's that will be the focus first and foremost to try to keep a clean sheet and create that chance with the likes of Eze. So yeah, I think it'll be a struggle, but I think it'll be a struggle for both sides trying to um, create chances and score goals. Yeah, the way <clears throat> excuse me, the way we will try and score goals will be quick transitions when we get the ball. So, so what Sean Dyche has done this season and what he has done very well is he sets traps and and. When a team has lost the ball in an area, we have broke very, very quickly. And it's been surprising to some teams. We went to Brentford, scored three goals at Brentford, and they, they did not expect it. There was a similar result at the end of last season, away at Brighton. We scored five goals at Brighton. And I think the whole Premier League was shocked by it. There's moments in the game where we will set a trap for you to come into. And if you lose the ball, we go for you. We will have four, four running at you. So that's how we will try and get a goal. Um I think, looking at it from Levertonian point of view, I think it's probably right to surrender the ball to you and play this way. I, I think you will be looking at Everton, rightly or wrongly, as a bottom-half Premier League team who, on your journey, you need to beat. And we need to play into that. We need to not get our cocky heads on and say, who are they to think that? We need to go, OK, that's fine. Let them feel comfortable against us. Let them feel they should beat us. Give them the ball. And the moment we get the ball, we punish them. I think that's how we set up. You've said how you set up there. 
is Hodgson good at changing styles in game? So, so for instance, if Everton go one 0 up on a counter, would he stick to what he does, or would he adjust things? Um, he doesn't really adjust things in terms of tactics. He'll he'll try to adjust things in terms of players. Yeah. Um, but even then, he's had a few problems with substitutions and his comments about younger players, etc. Because of because of the amount of injuries that we've had, our, our bench has looked weaker than than normal. But um, but then again, against Burnley, that the bench did look a bit stronger, and he did make them subs even when we were one nil up. Um, so. He's not. He's not going to. We're not going to switch up from. I don't know. Let's say from you know counter attacking football, possession football, to all of a sudden go all out attack. He won't yeah. do that. But he will try to change it up with a few players. Yes. So it's a case of um, looking at the game, seeing how it's going. Of course, we know that you will try to hit us on the counter, but mm-hmm. we will be. Well, we should be ready for that because I know. I know that's what we're going to expect. And Gay and Anderson. Um, maybe one of the fullbacks might stay behind as well to form a free. Um, but yeah, I, 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 it shouldn't be a high scoring game. Um, no. And in all honesty, when, it, when we talk about it, who's going to score goals, how we're going to break each other up, it, it doesn't sound like the most exciting game in the world <laughs> because I, I, right now I'm sensing there's going to be not that many goals. I think it's going to be mm. a case of if someone scores, they can they can nick the game um, 1-0 and I wouldn't be surprised with a draw. But yeah, it should be a tactical... Um, the tactical battle. Uh, we know what to expect from Everton. Everton know what to expect from Palace uh, with our cre- with our creative player, not creative players. Well, I use been solid so far this season, but Eze will be the main one, and we just have to try and nullify that and and get that get that goal. Literally get that goal. Try to break Everton down and maybe invite the pressure. Give you the ball. Maybe do roll uh, roll. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be screwed. We'll, we'll be screwed. Then. <laughs> We'll be absolutely screwed if you do that. Yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll say, you know what, Everton, you have the ball instead. Why do you always keep the ball? You have I'll the give, ball. We'll just give it back to you. Thank you, counter. <laughs> so it could, it, could, it could work both ways. Um, but but at home, I'm expecting Palace to have a bit more possession, and I'm expecting Everton to sit back. So and I, I, it's, it's going to be a game of who can break each other down. That yeah. I think that's going to be it. Look, I'm looking forward to it for, for different reasons. This is not going to be PSG versus Manchester City. It's not going to be that game. But for different reasons, I think it's going to be a very good game. You've got t- two you know, good managers. You've got two very historic big clubs who, who have gone through transitional periods. And I think it'll be a really good game. I'll give you my prediction, D. I think it's going to be 1-1. Um, and I'm going to... My storyline is that we hit you in the first half on a counter or a set piece. And then you do get back into it in the second half and you, and you score. And it's 1-1. If I had a free bet this weekend, that's where I put it. What are you saying as, as a counter? What's your prediction? How's it going to go? My prediction is there's two scores that's bugging me, but I'm going to stick with the original one. I could easily see it being nil nil as well. Mm. I could I could see that scenario at home, um, which which wouldn't be the worst thing. But I could you know with our defense, I could see us keeping a clean sheet. Uh, you lot also keeping a clean sheet because we're still missing a few attackers. But I'm going to go for one nil Palace, and the reason why I'm saying one nil Palace is I'm I'm looking at our defensive performances. It's been very good. I think that's been our strongest element um, to to the side so far this season. And if we keep another clean sheet, that'll be six and twelve. So fifty percent of the games we've kept the clean sheet, which will be very impressive to the start of the season. And the breakthrough, the only reason why I'm saying one nil is Eze. If you can stop Eze, then I could it'll be nil nil. But if you don't stop Eze, I could see him having that one moment to to create that chance. Because if he wasn't playing, then I I just I just don't see both sides really scoring goals, you know, honestly. Maybe from set pieces, as you mentioned, but then again, we have been good defending set pieces. I can't remember the last time we've conceded from a set piece. Maybe I'm forgetting, maybe I'm having short term memory, but yeah, it doesn't really happen that often. So it's like you're good at set pieces, we're good at defending set pieces. You're good at defense, we're good at def- like it, we kind of it, by by looking at the game from this perspective, we kind of balance each other out perfectly in terms of the areas. So I think it should be a tight game, but at home, maybe Eze could be the factor, and that's me being hopeful. It makes sense. I can also see that scenario. Eze is a really good player. It's proper Everton that he's back for us. It's it's obvious. It's the most Everton thing that you've been without him for so long. Enter Everton and he's back. And as you say, prop maybe even going to score the winner. See, it's been fantastic to get you back on. I always enjoy talking football with you. For any Palace fans who are watching, we've hashtagged the Crystal Palace hashtag in our YouTube show. Any Palace fans who are stumbling across this over on Twitter, the hashtag, sorry, the 
The name is Back of the Nest. D, do you want to tell any Palace fans who are watching what you're about, yeah. what you've got coming up? Yeah, Back of the Nest on YouTube, um, on Twitter, uh, all the all your social media platforms, Crystal Palace fan channel. We've got live match reactions, uh, previews, up to date Palace news stuff. So yeah, basically everything related to Palace. Um, check out Back of the Nest. Yeah, and, I, and I've watched a few shows as well in preparation for this and as well last season. Top shows, top content. So please go and check that out. Any Evertonians who are stumbling across us on your YouTube hole tonight, we're over at Across the Park PC. And we've got a show coming out again next week in the studio and then another match preview to come next week. So I hope any Evertonians hit like, share and subscribe on this one. Palace fans, head over to the back of the nest. It's going to be a good game, Saturday. Dave, thank you very much, my man, for coming back on the podcast. Thank you for having me on. Always a pleasure.